open session, right? Okay, members, uh, good morning. Welcome to the meeting. Um, we, we, we have a quorum here. Um, and I just uh, want to remind you, if we're, keep your microphones muted until you need to speak because background noise can be heard. The committee will be uh, recorded and broadcast uh, online and throughout Parliament buildings. And you're welcome to use mobile devices provided they are in muted or in aeroplane mode. Uh, I have no apologies. Chairperson's business. Uh, climate change number one bill. As you will be aware, the committee has had to defer our clause by clause scrutiny of this uh, bill. In order to ensure that the committee has adequate time to report before the 16th of December deadline, I suggest that next Thursday we proceed with clause uh, by clause consideration at our morning meeting and then hold a separate virtual meeting in the afternoon at 3 pm to go through the committee's draft report. Members okay with that? Okay, um, the Green Growth Consultation. I'd like to remind members that the Minister will be hosting a webinar on the draft Green Growth Strategy Consultation. An invitation has been sent to all members of the Assembly. Nick has also issued a reminder to all committee members to encourage uh, us all to attend. And a copy is on the correspondence of today's pack. In terms of the draft minutes, um, uh, the, they're from the 18th of November as a page five of your pack. Uh, can I seek agreement for the minutes? Yeah, I'll sign whenever <laughs> a moment. Uh, members, uh, in terms of matters arising, uh, I have been advised that the, uh, the UK government has held a number of meetings of specialised committees relating to the trade and cooperation agreement, and that officials from here have uh, been in attendance. And we, we haven't got any information from DERA about this. Are members okay that we write to de the department seeking clarity on what engagements there has been uh, with these committees? Um, okay. Okay, members, can I seek your agreement that the committee now moves to close session to con continue our informal deliberations on climate number one bill? Okay. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Um, we have a written briefing from the Research and Information Services uh, Public Finance Scrutiny Unit, uh, which is, looks at the cost of emission targets. Uh, members will recall the committee agreed to seek a written briefing from uh, RAISE on the potential financial implications of the proposed emissions targets set out in the climate bills, both of them. At page 16 of your PACs is a written briefing by the Assembly Research and Information Service on the potential cost of implementing the targets in legislation. Members will note that the paper makes particular reference to the financial implications for the executive budget. I'd like to invite Christopher Rothwell <coughs> to present his paper. Uh, Christopher, you're very welcome. And um, you, members, we will, we will uh, Chris, will you do your, if you don't mind doing your presentation and then we will be able to um, ask uh, questions uh, thereafter. Certainly. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll uh, briefly talk you through the briefing paper um, that's in your packs. So that was um, prepared for the limited purpose um, of looking at some of the financial implications of the emission reductions targets um, contained in the two climate change bills uh, currently under consideration of the committee. Um, it was prepared by myself and other members of the Public Finance Scrutiny Unit, that's the PFSU, um, within RAISE. Um, so it aims to speak to the facts known to us at the time. Um, and if there's any questions um, that I'm not able to answer now, um, then I'm happy to follow up with the committee um, or come back to them at, at a later time. So 
Uh, what I'll talk through is some of the background to the bills um, and the emission reduction targets, the national level targets, um, and then Northern Ireland's potential contribution to those. Um, before moving on to some of the financial implications um, of the targets, specifically the difference in their potential costs. So, section one of the paper um, covers some background to the two bills, um, and it looks specifically at their, their emission reduction targets. So, um, the first, the private members bill, um, with its reduction target of net zero by 2045, and the second, the DERA bill, um, with a reduction target of 82% by 2050. So, um, for context, the national level target um, that was brought about from legislation enacted in, in 2019 um, by Parliament, and that required the UK to re uh, reduce national emissions to net zero by 2050. Um, and in doing so, they amended the 2008 Climate Change Act, um, which previously stipulated a target of 80%. So um, that act, the 2008 act, also places a duty on the devolved administrations to contribute to the UK uh, meeting its national target. So obviously it's important to note that um, each of the devolved areas um, will have its own unique uh, economic circumstances and characteristics that will influence the extent to which it can contribute um, towards that target. So. In terms of Northern Ireland's contribution, um, the Minister wrote to the UK Government Climate Change Committee in February of 2020, and in its response in December of that year, the CCC, the Climate Change Committee, um, discussed some of the um, findings from its um, report titled The UK's Path to Net Zero. And in that report, they appeared to suggest um, that it would not... Uh, it would, reaching that UK target would not necessarily mean every part of the UK um, reaching net zero. So I'll quote it and it says, achieving net zero emissions for the whole UK by 2050 does not necessitate that every part of the UK, both geographical and sectoral, gets to zero emissions. Um, it also um, recommends that Northern Ireland set a target for emission reductions of 82% rather than net zero by 2050. So following this, um, we now have the two bills um, in question and their targets which have been introduced to the Assembly. Um, and this has raised questions then about some of the potential financial implications. Um, and this particularly relating to one of the points made by the Climate Change Committee, where they say, quote, our analysis has not produced a scenario for UK net zero in 2050 that sees Northern Ireland reach net zero in the same year we are not therefore able precisely to calculate the cost of Northern Ireland reaching net zero, but they will almost certainly be higher than those of the 82% reduction target by up to 900 million pounds per year by 2050. So to that end, <clears throat> section two of the paper um, in your packs looks at some of the implications of the uh, reduction emission reduction target. Specifically, it looks at that additional 900 million pound cost um, and unpick, try to unpick that. So in section two, um, we have, um, we reference uh, correspondence from April 2021, where the Climate Change Committee provided evidence to the department on the economic cost differences of those targets. So this is where they stated that the additional cost could be up to 900 million pounds by 2050. Um, so the team in the PFSU contacted the Climate Change Committee just to clarify some of the details around where that figure came from. Um, and essentially, it was based on the assumption that if Northern Ireland managed to make a reduction of 82% by 2050, that would leave emissions at 5 million tonnes of CO2. Um, and to bridge that gap and bring that figure to zero, they assumed that it would cost £180 per tonne um, for the removal um, of those emissions. So for £180 for one tonne, that equated to £180 million for a million tonnes, and therefore £900 million for five million tonnes. So um, in section 2.2 of the paper, there are a few points um, that we looked at in relation to that £900 million figure, um, and those include the extent or the scale 
um, of that additional cost um, that might be expected to be um, public expenditure. Um, the second point was the profile of how those costs may come in over time. And then the third was the potential limit um, or upper limit of those costs. So the first, in terms of the scale of the costs um, that might be public or not, um, in October 2021, the minister had written to the committee um, explaining that the extra cost was highly unlikely to be covered or funded by some sort of UK government um, net zero fund and that would be highly likely it would be borne by Northern Ireland. Um, however, there's one thing um, identified by the Climate Change, the UK Government Climate Change Committee, um, was that any investment required um, to reach the emissions reduction target um, should not be interpreted as capital expenditure that would be delivered solely through the Northern Ireland budget, so it wouldn't necessarily be all public expenditure. Um, and that would seem to suggest from what the CCC have said that it, would be, it could potentially be a combination of public and private sector um, expenditure and that the ratio, um, you know, the ratio between those two, public and private, may be something that needs um, warrants further investigation or maybe needs unpicked slightly. Um, and that also raises questions about how any public expenditure might be the responsibility of other departments um, besides the era. Um, second relates to the profile of costs, um, so that additional £900 million. Pounds. So in the same correspondence to the committee from the Minister, it was stated that the additional £900 million pounds, um, would come into effect as soon as the bill came into effect in 2022, um, in terms of reaching net zero. Um, however, the CCC stated that in their economic evidence, rather than that cost being incurred right away, um, it would be incurred by 2050, rather than in each year leading up to 2050. Um, so, um, again, when the PFSU spoke with the Climate Change Committee to clarify this, they stated um, that the £900 million was a point estimate, meaning um, an estimate made, um, like a best, a best estimate with the data they have available currently, and that the additional £900 million a year would not apply in every year between now and 2050. So that, that it would be lower in earlier years, reaching 900 million pounds in time, and then persisting at that level thereafter. So, um, obviously, the difference between a cost of 900 million pounds starting in 2022 and continuing versus a 900 million pounds cost figure that gets reached over time is quite significant, um, especially when you consider it in terms of the executive potentially contributing. Um, X amount towards that. And then the third um, point relating to that £900 million cost was the potential limit of it. So um, in the same correspondence I've just referenced there, um, Dara had stated that the additional cost would be at least £900 million to reach that emissions target of net zero by 2050, although the evidence uh, provided by the Climate Change Committee stated that it would be up to 900 million pounds a year, so um, potentially suggesting um, from what they said that that would be an upper limit um, of the cost that they could reach. Those, those are the, th the three main points that we addressed in section 2.2 of the paper. Um, and then obviously this raises questions about how any public expenditure to, to meet that might be met. So, um, for example, things like, would there be additional money sent from the UK government um, to cover that additional cost? Um, or would the executive have to make its own choices about how to reallocate resources from other departmental priorities um, to cover that cost? Um, so in the paper, you'll see, um, I've done a bit of a refresher on, or an outline of what we call the public finance framework. So in the interest of time, um, I'll just touch very briefly on it. So that's section 2.3.1, um, basically discusses the fact that the, the executive receives um, the majority of its funding um, for public expenditure through from the Treasury um, through what's called the block grant. Um, and that's because we currently have quite limited powers for um, our own revenue raising. Um, and that allocation is determined through what's called the Barnett formula, um, as I'm sure you're aware. 
So additional allocations can be made through that formula um, when additional spending is generated from the UK government um, and, it, and also is in a devolved area. So an example of that might be health increasing, um, health spending increasing by 100 million um, at the UK level. Um, and Northern Ireland would receive around 3 million then as a result of that. And that's because Northern Ireland's population is around 3% of uh, England's and because health is also a devolved matter in Northern Ireland. So the overall funding um, that's allocated um, in this way um, forms what's called the spending envelope and then that forms the basis in which um, the Minister of Finance can then form uh, a draft budget. So that's the limit within which the MP um, can work. Um, so the PFSU team um, that worked on this paper, we contacted um, both the Department of Finance and Treasury officials just to, um, I suppose, confirm um, information on how these additional costs for a net zero target um, might be met. Um, and in both cases, they confirmed that it would, it would not uh, be met by additional funding from the UK government. Um, or through through the um, through the Barnett formula allocations, um, the only circumstance in which that would happen would be if um, the equivalent UK government department also received additional funding for the same purpose. Um, so essentially, it would it seems to suggest that it would have to be met through reallocations of the executive's existing budget at that time. So. In conclusion of what that, the paper covers, um, it looks at some of the main aims of the bills, um, particularly focusing on that, uh, the targets that each of them set for reductions. Um, and it appears from what the UK Climate Change Committee have said, um, is that aiming for a target of net zero would occur an additional cost. So I'll quote here, they say at this time, our assessment is that a net zero target covering all greenhouse gases cannot credibly be set for Northern Ireland. Targets should be ambitious, but must be evidence-based and deliverable with a fair and equitable route map to achieving them. Section 2 of the paper then looked at that additional cost of $900 million in a little bit more detail, um, specifically how it was calculated, um, and then looked at some of the points relating to the extent that that cost may be public or private, um, the profile of that cost over time and, and the potential limit of it, and then finished with looking at how the additional cost may be met or, or who might meet it. Um, so to do that, we had checked with the Department of Finance and Treasury, who both confirmed that no additional monies um, would be made available um, to do that, and that it would have to be met from within the executive budget um, being reallocated. Um, so that's a brief overview of the paper. Um, thank you um, for the opportunity for presenting it, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to follow up on them or, or take any of those now. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Chris. That was very um, helpful and very timely uh, piece of work that you're doing, that you've done for us here, and thanks for presenting it this morning. Um, there's a number of members who want to ask questions, but there's just, a, I suppose there's a couple of points um, that I've been looking at here. So um, we, we can start off from the point of view that the UK CCC have said that they cannot precisely calculate the costs of the North region net zero uh, by 2050. And they've already said that, um, but they, they do believe it would be higher than their recommended targets. And also then we have a situation where the UK CCC had said the costs, um, sorry, they clarified to us, they referred to the 900 million per year by 2050. If uh, engineered gas uh, removal technology were used, and then they clarified that in 15th November to us that this was a point estimate and it wouldn't be the case every year. Yet we have the dear minister who has interpreted this uh, as an extra £900 million every year to 2050. And, and on top of that there, uh, stating that, um, that this would have been borne by here in the north, yet we have the the um, UKCC making the point to us that um, that the co that the investment cost should not be interpreted as, as being delivered solely through the Northern Ireland budget, nor as costs that only Northern Ireland business consumers have to bear. Many of the actions to reduce emissions will likely be paid for at UK level, 
and are socialised across the whole of the UK. Well, you know, is it fair to assume that that the minister has grossly exaggerated uh, the cost, well, mis misinterpreted what the UK CCC are saying, and in turn has grossly exaggerated the potential cost of the private members' bill? Which, you know, obviously this is a matter of huge public discourse, uh, which uh, clearly will have fed into that there. And, you know, is, is it, in your view, um, uh, Chris, do you think it's accurate for anyone to be claiming with any, um, you know, clear basis that the PMB would cost an additional 900 million a year? Um, Chair, it wouldn't really be for me to say, um, or you know, comment on the interpretation of the bill um, from the minister or any, or any members. Um, I think what we've, we've tried to do with the paper there is just present, I suppose, both sides um, of the view on what the costs may be um, and, you know, how I suppose the profile of them over time and how they may be met. So it's sort of you know, intended as a statement of the facts rather than an interpretation of, um, you know, one, one member's, uh, you know, interpretation of them. Um, so it's you know it wouldn't really be my place to sort of say how they've been interpreted by the minister. If that's if that's makes yeah. sense. Yeah, but uh, but I suppose mathematically there would be a gross difference between the extra nine hundred million a year starting in twenty twenty two up to twenty fifty compared to the nine hundred extra nine hundred million pound a year coming in closer to twenty fifty, which UK CCC is saying. You know, when the minister hinges. Um, you know, a lot on what the UKCCC is saying, but that would be a gross difference, wouldn't it? But, um, yeah, in any in any case of any, you know, in any bill um, or any public expenditure, you know, the difference in you know a cost being incurred immediately and then sustained at that level over time is is obviously going to be different from one that reaches that that amount over time and sort of profiles more gradually. Um, yes, but like but like I said. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be my place to interpret uh, or comment on yeah. um, the minister's interpretation of, of any figures. Yeah. So, uh, well, based on the the response that we got from the UK CCTC, the minister has misinterpreted what their advice was. Uh, again, chair, um, it, I I couldn't really comment on on their interpretation on the minister's interpretation or. Or whether it's been misinterpreted or not, like as I said, it was it, you know the the figures are intended as a statement of the facts um, from the CCC and from any correspondence we've seen and referenced in the paper. But um, I couldn't really it, it wouldn't be my place um, to to comment on on the interpretation of the figures. I think that would be for the committee. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Philip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks uh, to Chris. Uh, and Chris has very valiantly uh, refrained from commenting on it, uh, but he has done a really good job in producing facts. And I mean, I think we're all agreed that that the climate emergency uh, it is the biggest issue dealing politicians across the world, and so therefore it's the biggest issue dealing politicians here in the north, and it, it is. Uh, vitally important that we do deal with it based on facts. So Chris hasn't given us interpretation, but he has laid down the facts. So I'm going to give an interpretation of them, and it is clear. It, I mean, it, it's it's clear that for whatever reason, uh, political or otherwise, or ideologically or otherwise, that uh, the minister has misinterpreted uh, th th these figures. Uh, and also, I mean, he, he, he has done that by writing to us and the committee, misinterpreting them. He has uh, made statements in the assembly where he has misinterpreted them. You know, I, I, I was quickly researching and he was on Radio Ulster on, I think it was the 29th of October, uh, where he was claiming that the private member's bill would cost uh, one billion a year. So, I mean, th that's clearly not the case. Uh, so. You know, I mean, Chris has very clearly laid, laid down, identified three, three important facts. One, the CCC chairs you have pointed out have said, you know, they, they, they haven't analysed uh, the costs with regard to net zero. Uh, 
they have given an estimation and the minister has overinterpreted that estimation where the CCC have said uh, at least and the minister has, has said that, that that would be every year when that, that clearly isn't the case. It's, it's only in terms of going the additional from 82 to net zero. So, I mean, I, I think this is a very important piece of work in terms of our business and it's also a very important piece of work in probably uh, uh, identifying that how, how far the minister has went from the very beginning where he started off talking about no climate emergency or unhelpful to talk about climate emergency where he then continued saying he couldn't bring legislation uh, where then he was forced to bring legislation uh, he was forced to bring legislation that legislation was unambitious he then started uh, scaremongering in terms of the potential harm that any legislation would do and now we have seen where he has for whatever reason misinterpreted or exaggerated uh, the costs I, I think it's important for this committee you know to point all of that out I, I know we wrote to the minister and I, I think that the work that Chris has done has very clearly put on paper in black and white the facts of the issue for everybody to see. I mean, I have no questions for Chris. I think his questions have all been answered within his paper, and I appreciate and thank him for the work that he's done. Thank you, Philip. Uh, John? <coughs> John Blair? John? Yep, Chair. Sure. So, thank you, Ian. Can I also thank Chris for the information presented and the explanation, the clear explanation that he gave, or as clear, or as clear as he could possibly give um, in that regard? Um, uh, the question, I think, has to be, first of all, and this, this is what I know Chris can't answer, but when a government department or, or a minister comes up with um, costs as a barrier in relation to something like this, then the obvious question is, um, well, how did other regions, including every, uh, every other region on these islands, manage to make this commitment? That's the first thing. Um, and I'm sensing, and maybe Chris can confirm, that there was no... Um, reference in anything he gleaned from the department to how other departments were managing, other, other regions were managing to make this commitment at departmental or ministerial level. The second one is, was there any evidence that um, the costs of not doing this were factored in and balanced with the overall cost? For example, the costs of dealing with coastal erosion. Um, money that might come back into the economy if people's homes are better insulated through a bit of investment, money that might come back into the economy in addition to that with the skills required and the jobs created by doing some of that work. And also, of course, the the human cost regionally um, and internationally, globally, if we don't do this, was, it, was any of that factored into any of the information that was presented by or... Um, brought from the department to, to Chris's research. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of the first part in how other um, devolved areas had legislated for this, it's not, to be honest, it's not something that we we intend, you know, set out to look at in this paper, so it's not something I could provide a definitive answer on, um, I'm afraid. Um, and in terms of the second part of your second and third part of your question of you know would there be any cost associated with not uh, analysis of the cost associated with not doing it um again it's not something we looked at in particular detail um usually when um public expenditure um measures are sort of being looked at at first and um, there'll be an exercise to do like you know look at what's called like the counterfactual so it'll be you know the, the cost or the impact of doing it versus not doing it and um, so i can't say for certain if if the cost of not doing it have been looked at or the potential economic impacts associated with you know you know the job impacts and things associated with home insulation and things like that i'm not to be honest um chair i wouldn't I'm, i couldn't say definitively and um, i know that in a lot of Public expenditure um, projects; these sort of things, these you know, they can be looked at when they're doing um, appraisals of them for of the spend, for example. But I'm not sure in this case. Um, to answer your question. Okay, Chris, that, that's understandable, but but it looks to me that um, uh, it's almost like presenting a hard charging list of um, expenses when other costs are, are not being presented. But that's something the committee can examine, and all of us can examine individually uh, as we move through these processes. And thank you for that. Okay. Um, William. 
Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes? Yes, William. Yeah. I resent very much official members attacking the Minister at the end of the day. This assembly, the assembly in Northern Ireland was closed for three years. And that's one of the main reasons why there's nothing brought forward in climate change. And we all know who was responsible for that and who brought the assembly down. Uh, in relation, can I ask, uh, Chris, in relation to the 900 million per year, is it clear that the Climate Change Committee, or what do you mean it, in relation to the Climate Change Committee's uh, climate change committee saying that there's going to be an extra or the possible 900 million a year. Is there any idea how long or many years that was deemed to be? Or so in terms of how how many years once the cost reaches 900 million yeah. that would persist for? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, in correspondence with the climate change committee, the response was um, that it would. In their words, reach 900 million over time and persist at that level, or could persist at that level thereafter. It doesn't have a set, you know, date of say 10 or 15 years thereafter. It just says persist at that level thereafter. Yeah. So 900 million years for this for 25 years, or it, it could make a difference, of course, how many years it is for. But it's, it's going to be a very substantial amount of money, one way or another, or whether it's 10 years or whether it's. 25 years, it's going to be a substantial amount of money that will have to be found from somewhere, isn't that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, 900 million pounds is a large amount of money uh, for any, you know, in, in terms of any economy, um, especially one the size of Northern Ireland. Um, and you know, that's, that's where we've made the sort of, made the points in section 2.2 around um, just trying to clarify, you know, what sort of form would that, would that cost come in? Would it be immediately or would it be over time? Um, or would that be an upper limit? And if if that was the amount, you know, how much of it would be borne by the public or private sectors? But yeah, it would be a substantial amount, regardless of regardless of uh, the policy that's related to. Yeah, I was also. Um, uh, do you know, Chris? Other regions of the UK, the Climate Change Committee was set up to. Uh, and look into the four regions of the UK, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. I take it or I presume the other regions of the UK took on board the recommendations from the Climate Change Committee. Am I right in saying that? Uh, to be honest, the legislation of uh, Wales and Scotland, the other two devolved areas, isn't something, you know, the the timeline to it and how it was how they did it wasn't something we looked at in particular detail for this paper so I couldn't I couldn't really comment on that I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, William. Um okay, who have we got now? Harry. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Chris. Good to see you all today again. <clears throat> I'm just thinking Chris going over the figures like nine hundred million. I mean, that really is an estimate or a guesstimate, and it has the potential of being even more, which indeed is the way things most times go. So, and if that is taken, then we can be sure, or I imagine we can be sure that that will come out of our block grant. And as far as depending on the UK um, funding us, I don't think they would ever do that because we'd be turning around to look. We'll give you a recommendation here, um, which is it can be met without this extra. So they're not going to fund us anymore. I would say, you know, I wouldn't be depending on them. So that's what would worry me would be that the cost could actually rise. I mean, it's actually high enough, but you take out of that rules and came out of our block grant would be very, very serious indeed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, perhaps I. Chair, I think my question has been more or less answered, but just in regard to, um, and I know Chris, what he has done is he's saying this is up to 900 million by, by 2050. Uh, there was no indication in the research that, that you said, uh, or that you came across, sorry, uh, from the Climate Change Committee as to how graduated that would be step by step, year on year, no? 
Uh, no, nothing that we've seen uh, from them. Um, I haven't seen any detailed um, evidence from them um, and what the cost may be over time. And I think we might have included something, the team might have included something in the paper to say that, you know, it might be worth asking or looking at how that cost might actually be incurred over time. Um, presumably, if they're able to say that it would happen in a sort of profile, gradual, you know, sort of manner over time, then they, they will have done estimates of what that would be um, to reach 900 million over that time. But it's not something we, we saw or, or to be honest, asked for. And it was more just a sort of high, higher level explanation of whether it's immediate or, um, you know, gradual over time. I think, Chair, well, I suppose maybe if, if you didn't ask for it, it, there may well be no answer to it because it would be predicated upon what actions have been taken at what level by government over what specific period of time. I understand that. But, uh, Chair, uh, certainly for our own interests, and if you like to round off, if you like, that bit of experience that we're going through with this climate change bill, it would be helpful if uh, Reyes could... Uh, if Reyes could raise that with the, the Climate Change Committee people to see if they have any uh, even suggested projections of costs that might be associated uh, year on year as we, in the build up to that suggested 900 million. Yeah. I'd say you've, you've preempted us all here because um, the, the, Nick, uh, the, the, the clerk has re recently got that information from the UK CCC and will uh, circulate right. that round. We'll, we'll circulate that sorry, round. Okay. Members. Oh, don't be sorry because it's going to be, be circulated uh, in members. That's okay, thank you. And that's all I needed to know just to finish off that wee bit of uh, okay. evidence for us, please. Thank you, Patsy. Claire. Thank you. Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and thank you for this paper, Chris. It's um, it's incredibly useful. And I'm just wondering when you were um looking at all this, um, and when the CCC's scenario pathways are stating that um, not all regions of the UK necessarily need to get to net zero. Um, I was wondering if you have found any costings or projected costings, or any sort of assessment of financial implications for any area or region who are not net zero um, and if that has been accounted for and I'm thinking in your paper there it's um, you're saying here simply stated it appears from the CCC's reported estimation that if Northern Ireland reduced emissions by 82% by 2050 the CCC estimate that Northern Ireland would still be emitting five MTC carbons by 2050. And that figure is equivalent to is it five million tonnes of CO2. So if we're still emitting 500, or sorry, five million tonnes of CO2, what's the, where are the financial costs or implications been um, projected for that, for those emissions? Um, in terms of how they've reached that, um that five million ton figure and um, there is a little bit more detail on it um, in the paper that UK's path to net zero um, I think it's if it's not something the committee has um, already um, then it's something I can provide but it's it's basically quite a detailed analysis um, and it shows I think different when they talk about pathways I think there's different scenarios and that was one of them reaching that five uh, megaton level there's others where it reaches you know lesser levels or more i think that's just one of a number of scenarios but i think that was the one associated with the 82 percent and that's the one that's referenced there um but it should be something that um is i think it's noted on the committee's website so it should be correspondence the committee has but it's um the the piece of work that the ccc did and um, that that's contained and it's very detailed um a lot of it's you know environment you know, like scientific analysis um that goes above my head but um that's that's where that comes from. Yeah, so that's you know when they talk about it being a point estimate, I think that's you know it's what they've got based on the, the data that they have available to them at the time that they were writing it. Okay, and then just um again, and this nine hundred million figure, I mean that's an estimated backloaded figure, so it's not even a front loaded cost because it's gonna come 
on an estimate in years to come, depending on, and, and that could vary then, obviously, so if it's not an upfront cost and if it's not going to be implemented straight away, it's something that will roll out as the years progress and the whole sort of landscape changes. So mm -hmm. it's an estimate, you know, we don't know where we'll be in 10 years, we don't know where we'll be in 20 years, and you know, these technology costs will come after that. Um, but I'm thinking that when the CCC suggests then, and as is quoted in your paper again as well, that the use of removal technologies to reach the net zero target in Northern Ireland may require Northern Ireland to take a greater share of those technologies than would be a pro or proportional to Northern Ireland's current population, population, land area or economy. So that's really, is that sort of really going down into that this pathway scenario that these figures are coming from is um, is a financial pathway in terms of where the UK are going to cite sort of technology, carbon removal technologies across the, the whole four regions, rather than Northern Ireland not being capable, I suppose? Um, yeah, I think that, that's part of it, yeah. Um... When you say, you know, pathway, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure maybe I didn't pick up the last part of your question correctly there, um, apologies, but um, when they talk about the pathways, um, I think it's from my reading of the report that the CCC had done, um, the pathways refer to different sort of scenarios and I think different adoptions of those technologies across the UK is what informed those pathways. Um, and, you know, in terms of the cost and how it profiles or potentially profiles over time, you know, my reading of or you know, our understanding from what the CCC has stated, um, and what I mentioned there during the presentation was that, you know, that nine hundred million figure is based on, you know, calculations on estimates of what the removal cost may be. So, you know, like like any modeling financial or, you know, otherwise, you know, they're they're always based on assumptions. So that that hundred and eighty pound per per ton, I think it was for removal. Could be more, could be less, but that's that's what they've provided in the, in this example. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's that. Yeah, I see when the CCC say that um, many of the actions to reduce emissions will likely be paid for at UK level and or socialised across the whole of the UK. Um, and there's another quote in your paper there uh, um, as well. I'm um, uh, wondering, is there any word that you've come across that sort of gives a projected balance of what the public private cost split would be? Uh, not that I've seen um, and that's why we've tried to reference there that it's something that, that um, may, well, should be unpicked further and um, it would work in further investigation um, because you know it's important to understand that if there is any sort of cost associated with this um, who pays it so I think we've included their scrutiny points throughout that paper and um, the blue boxes and I think one of them um, should anyway should relate to um, what that balance may be, you know, between public and private, and so on. Um, because from again, from what they stated, it doesn't seem like they're suggesting that it necessarily would be solely public. Um, but it's not something that we've would come across or included in this um, in answer to your original question. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it's I'm, I'm sure it's something that does need unpicked a little bit further. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Tom. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chris, for your presentation this morning. And we've been looking at the uh, obviously 900 million uh, for this cost. That's no doubt going to come out of the block grant, which is going to have a huge implication for us uh, in the assembly. But um, looking further than that a little bit, what about the local councils? Is there going to be an added cost on to local councils as a result of this? And if so, who's going to pick up that tab? That tab? Is it going to have to be picked up by the repair? Chris? Chris, you're on mute. Apologies, Chair. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So of that 900 or potential 900 million, um, again, it's, it's not certain um, how much of that would be public. And then of that, what the expectation would be on local councils as opposed to the executive um, and I suppose that's something that would 
you know, be an outworking of, of any new legislation. Um, so um, to, in answer, you know, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not sure I couldn't say definitively um, what, what the implication might be for local councils, because I'm not sure what, you know, even what split the cost may be or, you know, the scale of the cost overall. Um, so, it, you know, it'd go through a couple of levels of disaggregation before it would get to the potential implication for local councils. So, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to say with any real detail of what it might be. Yeah, but it is fair to say then that local council will be financially affected by this. It will be another financial burden that they will have to pick up. If there was, you know, if, if I guess the workings of any new legislation stipulated that local councils had, you know, had a duty imposed on them to do certain things or not do certain things, then then yes, that would become part of the cost that they would incur. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And um, Rosemary. Thank you, thank you. Um, I was going to ask about the local councils like Tom has, but I want to also ask, it's in relation to the financial burden and, burden and the 900 million that we're, that we're, talk, we're talking about here. Um, in, relation, in relation to this, so you have the 900 million, we don't know where that's going to come from, we don't know who's going to pay for it, but it's likely it's going to be a financial burden here in Northern Ireland. So, on top of that, the people within the agricultural sector and the agri-food economy, they are also going to, so not only will they be subjected to perhaps higher taxes to pay for this 900 million or whatever, so they are also going to be doubly hit because they're going to have to uh, redu reduce their production uh, in relation to agriculture, cut their number of animals, etc., and then the agri-food that'll obviously have a knock-on knock-on impact to the agri-food economy. So they're all, they're going to be doubly hit. Am I right? Um, in terms of the impact, the specific sectors, um, it's not something um, that we you know covered in any real detail in the paper. It is something that the CCC do cover. In detail, because you know the the estimates that they make are based on assumptions and information on the sort of concentration of different sectors in each of the devolved areas, um, and therefore their contribution to the target for the UK. So, you know, concentration in things like agriculture and transport um, and other sectors, um, that will affect the extent to which they can contribute to emissions reductions. Um, it's not something, you know, the, the specific impact on different sectors, such as agri-food, as you mentioned, um, isn't something that we covered here, but it is something that will have factored into the estimates of the CCC. So I wouldn't really be able to comment with any real um, detail, I'm afraid, on, on the specific impact on certain sectors in Northern Ireland. And this is more of a sort of overview of the, the the high level cost overall to the public finances. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so we could have, we could have various sectors of the economy double have a double whammy for them. Um, again, like I said, I'm not I'm not really I couldn't really comment on on the potential impact of specific sectors, but it would be something the CCC have probably looked up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Claire, you want in for a quick one, Claire? There, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Listen, I, I'm getting a wee bit concerned. I mean, this 900 million um, we're seeing is an estimate of later costs in later years under this projected pathway. Um, we've also heard from the department as well that um, they've also claimed that the costs of reaching net zero in Northern Ireland under any reasonable assumptions will always be several billion pounds more than the costs of reaching 82% emissions. So the costs and the figures are out there. And I just want to remind members that, you know, this is the greatest threat to humanity that we're facing. Urgent action needs to be taken. There is no get out of jail free card for anybody. Costs will be incurred by all sectors at all levels. And that there are other costs out there that show that the cost of action, taking action, will be around 1% to 2% of GDP, but the cost of inaction 
would be somewhere in the region of 10% of GDP. So the longer we do not act, the more it's going to cost. So there is no cost-free way to deal with the emergency that we're facing and that we need to get really serious about that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, okay, well, Chris, thank you very, very much. Um, that was an extremely um, helpful contribution that you've made this morning. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff have been uh, thrown up here um, around the fact that you know the, the UK CCC said they can't precisely predict uh, the, the cost. They, they're speculating nine, up to 900 million. It's not going to be 900 million a year. And importantly, the UK CCC are telling us this just wouldn't all be paid out of uh, here. It would be spread across the uh, other parts of the um, different regions. So that's very, very helpful, Chris, for, for this morning. And listen, we'll be hearing from you again sometime. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nat. Okay, members. Um, members, um, can I uh, propose that we uh, perhaps maybe... Bring some of this to attention. Members, can you members, can you mute yourselves, please? Okay. Okay, members. Um, okay. okay. Thanks very much. Okay. So we're going to move on then to the uh, the correspondence, right? Uh, members, the page thirty one is your correspondence. Okay, green growth strategy. Um, members, page 36 of your packs is a departmental response to the committee queries uh, around funding for the green growth strategy. Uh, the department has confirmed that 1.2 million of in-year funding has been allocated to the following areas. Strategy and action plan development, climate change mitigation research and research, climate change adaptation, NI presence at COP26, program management and coordination. Further, the 600 million capital bid to the Department of Finance will cover six themes, agri-food, forestry and nature, blue economy, circular economy and waste, and public sector decarbonisation and rural decarbonisation. Remember, okay, we seek an update on when the bid is submitted to the Department of Finance. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, the biogenic methane, page 48 of the PACS is correspondence from the Department in respect of is engaging with the gas sector and the de department, department for the economy and the potential to harness biogenic methane in the local gas network. The department has met with gas providers on this issue and has been asked to establish an interdepartmental biomethane stakeholder group in order to progress the initiative. The department has also confirmed that it will progress towards reducing fossil fuel consumption through renewable energy, but that any increase in the number of anaerobic disasters should not adversely impact the environment. Members are okay, they'll be right to the department to have cited the membership in terms of reference of the Biomethane Stakeholder Group and receive a bi-monthly update in respect to their work. Okay, members. Members, uh, page, uh, um, page 51 of your packs is a letter from the department regarding questions raised by BBC Spotlight Programme uh, regarding NEA's oversight of Dalridian's operation in Tyrone. And... Um, Members, so if you have any members, any questions in this, or they want to raise any points, you can raise them now, or you can forward them to Nick at a later uh, stage. Okay. Um, remember? Okay, members, the, um, the cost of climate change bills, page 39, as a response in respect of queries regarding its draft. Oh, sorry, Patsy. Question? Patsy? Yeah. Uh, just back on here. Yeah, in regard to that, Dalridian, and I think it would be important that, in light of a lot of the concerns that were raised during the course of that uh, spotlight program, that we have the representatives from NIEA there at the committee at some stage to pose questions to them about processes followed uh, to reassure ourselves that, in fact, um, adequate processes have been followed to date and that the role of NIEA has in fact been rigorous and scrupulous in regard to any applications associated with that project. Yeah, well, Patsy, I would certainly agree with you on that there. Are members, other members happy enough with that suggestion? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, Thank Patsy. You. Yeah, absolutely, Patsy. Thank you. Um, okay, members, uh, so cost of climate change bills, page 39. So the department's response in respect of queries regarding 
is draft regulatory impact assessment climate change bill number two. Key points are as follows. The, uh, it's, the RIA is still in draft and subject to change. The department uh, will review uh, it as new evidence analysis or advice emerges. Pursuing that zero by 2050 will incur additional costs um, than at least the 82% position by 2050. The department has updated its RIA in light of the committee's request to change additional costs from at least 900 um, per annum to up to 900 per annum. The department did not provide a rationale for including the analysis 900 million each year from 22 onwards, except to say that the analysis is undertaken on a basis of front-loading action. The department did not specifically answer the point raised that the CCC analysis represent the entire economy cost and not solely the cost to the public purse. The members, now the briefing we received earlier from RAISE, can I ask uh, if the committee is content to write the department advising that we revisit the projected cost for achieving net zero by 2050 and to clarify for the record any previous statements uh, made um, by the Minister of Officials with regards to net zero uh, by 2050 costing at least 900 million per annum than going for 82% uh, by 2050. Okay. Members? Okay. Uh, members, okay, we act on the rest of the correspondence in the index sheet as suggested. Members, uh, for work programme, um, the, the page 82, 92, sorry, I'd like to draw members' attention to the scheduled briefing from the Department on the 9th of December in respect to the consultation outcomes on the bovine TB eradication proposals. The Department has confirmed that this briefing will only cover the results of the consultation and will not discuss future policy. Um, provision or, or confined, confirmed way forward, which will be determined at a later date. Um, so it's an opportunity to advise, um, to, to um, focus on the, on the results. So, um, member, and it will be an opportunity for us, I suppose, to offer our views on, on, on what we, we think as well. Member, are we okay to, to action the forward, the, can we agree the forward work programme? Okay. Okay, members, um, you'll be aware that of the AOB. Members, you'll be aware that any uh, the ongoing issues facing pig farmers as a result of the shortage of butchery workers, CO2 supplies, and the importation of lower cost uh, pork produce. In other cases of pig batches not being accepted by pork processors continues to increase. Patsy, this is a, a, um, an issue that you'd uh, asked to bring up under AOB. Do you want to uh, elaborate on it? Yeah, Chair, and um, indeed, uh, um, there's correspondence there included from Emma Badger on behalf of herself and her father. And it just specifically refers to Carol Foods and uh, if, if you like the commercial drive that they have indeed bordering on on a sort of commercial blackmail against some pig farmers there about how they should produce pigs and how they should, um, in fact, the, the two outlined, they outlined two methods of people producing pigs to the to the to the plant, and one involves a significant loss per pig of uh, thirteen pounds uh, fifty. So, uh, the, there's two things about that. One is um, that, in fact, if I could ask that this be drawn to the attention of the department, and indeed any other relevant department that that would be associated with this. Um, but the second thing is um, to determine from the department if, in fact, they have any form of um, oversight or intervention method that they can, in fact, look at these methods of commercial activity bordering on nigh on blackmail when they have people over a barrel uh, to drive down the cost to them and, in fact, to, to place significant financial difficulties upon farmers that are in that situation. Okay, okay Patsy, members, okay? We ask them what Patsy is suggesting. Um, Okay, Patsy. Just when you're 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 on a flow there, <laughs> you also had, uh, had asked um, to raise about the recent appointment of the new board members to Afby. Yes, indeed. Um, that involves the appointment of David Campbell, uh, known to many of us as a member or the chairperson of the Loyalist Community Council. Now, I have uh, I'm aware that others who were appointed to the board of Afby had um, and indeed did declare their political activity or political involvement. So I just wanted to establish that, in fact, all due process was followed in the case of Mr. Campbell and his appointment to the board, and in fact, anyone else uh, that was appointed to the board, but specifically given that he has a very high um, level of uh, political 
a profile in relation to the Loyalist Community Council and Loyalist paramilitary organisations. So uh, I would want to assure myself that indeed the process was adequately followed there. If we could get uh, some detail from the department around that, please. Thank you. Members okay with that? Um, okay. Uh, Rosemary? Rosemary? <laughs> Yeah, no, I wanted to come back in on the pigs issue in relation to the pigs issue. Um, so, oh, my screen has gone down a bit. You see your ornaments up on the shelf there, Rosemary? So we can yeah, hear yeah. <laughs> um, look, what I, want, what I want to say is that I understand on a Saturday morning. On a Saturday morning, that producers are going to be charged extra for having pigs now pro, uh, brought in the Saturday morning for processing. Can that be investigated? Why? Why we have difficulties? I know with the factories and with our workers. And why are farmers being charged extra on a Saturday morning or a Saturday for having their pigs processed? Thank you, Rosemary. That's something we'll definitely raise. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, William. William. William, you have your, you're on mute, I think. You're still on mute, William. Okay, now. We hear you now. We hear you now. Okay, I'm just on the same issue. The big issue. I have a number of pig farmers concerned, but also I think. Patsy, uh, and I suppose Rosemary has touched on some of the issues. There's no doubt that, I mean, uh, for a factory to tell the farmer if he supplies 80% of the pigs he normally supplies, they'll give him full price, but if he supplies 100%, they'll, they'll cut him. 13 pound of pigs seems very unfair. They can take the pigs okay if they're, if they're going to get them at a, at a discount. So it does certainly seem uh, very unfair and left themselves open to. I think the, the, the processors left themselves open to ridicule in relation to this one because they're quite happy to take the pigs as they, as they get them at less money, but uh, they will pay them full price for 80% of the pigs, so it, it, it is a form, no doubt it's a form of blackmail, there's no doubt about that. Okay. Thank you for that, William. Um, Mary? Mary, you're on mute. Mary, you're on mute. There. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I just want to follow on from what Patsy was saying there. Um, maybe I don't have the full details of how public appointments are made, but I think we're all aware that we haven't had a public appointments commissioner in office since, I think, May of this year. Do we know how you, you, people can be appointed if we don't have a commissioner in place? Can that still go ahead? I don't know. Yeah, yeah I think that's something maybe that whenever in the correspondence to the department that we asked them to set out the selection process, what selection process the department uses in making public appointments. Okay. okay. Thank you, Claire. Um, let me see now. Okay. So members, um, thank you very much uh, for that there. Um, don't go offline because we have to continue um, with a number of other briefings and our informal deliberations. Um, the next formal meeting is next Thursday and we're into a new month, 2nd December at 10 a.m. and it'll be a hybrid meeting streamed on the Assembly website. So just stay online because we're just going on now to uh, do some informal uh, deliberations. Okay, thank you. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.